Hello. Hi. Hey, it's Scott here. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Good. I am just um, sharing my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Looks like there's a few other people already on the line. Great. Hi everybody, it's Marie speaking here and I'm just waiting for a few more people to come on the line. So for the, those of you just joining in, my name is Marie, and we're just waiting another minute or two for everybody to get online. If you've got your video on, you could turn that off, um, as well as maybe mute, um, so that we don't have a lot of background noise, please. So I think we have a couple of people who are showing up um, on video. So just a reminder, just to turn off your video, um, just so hopefully that makes things a little bit quicker for us as we go today. And you can put yourselves on mute and we will start up in a minute or so. Okay, I think we're at 11 o'clock here, and uh, as I mentioned already, my name is Marie, and I'll be taking you through the first tra refresher training 
this year on Live Press. We've also got Scott uh, Leslie, who we know, and he's on the line here. And uh, maybe I'll just let Scott start off with a few words. If he, I think uh, you are not on mute, which is great. Yeah. Hi, everybody, and thanks for uh, joining us. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, welcome you and also uh, just a couple of comments. So um, uh, you would have all seen the uh, Live Press uh, uh, satisfaction survey out of which we also sort of uh, created the uh, topics and so forth in this session. Um, I wanted to let you know that uh, uh, so we're, we're digesting the feedback on that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we are going to focus um, uh, in this summer uh, on a few key pieces uh, in terms of redevelopment and reworking because we're consistently seeing across the board some problems with them. So one of the main ones being uh, the one we're going to address first is the carousels. Um, so uh, a number of libraries have experienced issues with those. And so uh, our lead developer, uh, Ben Holt, is going to spend some time uh, reworking those. So hopefully those issues go away. But uh, yeah, thank you, Marie, for coming back. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Marie, for a long time, uh, led the uh, press service uh, and uh, left the co-op about a, a year or so ago to pursue her own uh, uh, new path. Um, but I managed to lure her back to uh, do a couple of training sessions for us uh, to backfill a need we had. So I'm really glad uh, she was able to come back and help us. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be here and it's great to see um, some familiar names. I have not seen many faces. I've always been online with you, but um, it's been great to, to be back and dive right back in. And I think a lot of you have done some amazing work with your websites. I've been poking around to see what's new there. And I'm really impressed with where you're taking things. And hopefully we can help um, just brush up on a few of the, the basics today. And then we will dive in deeper in the second session um, with some more complex tasks. And then the third session right now is a little bit open in terms of what we'll cover, depending on what's happening today and, and the next session, what you would prefer to see for that last session. So today what we'll be doing is we'll just be kind of doing a little review of the website, how, how, why it's set up the way it is, a little bit of a tour of the front end, and then we'll be going into the administration screens or otherwise known as the dashboard. We'll be taking a look at some of the site manager tools and also a few of the basic editing things. So I will dive right in and hopefully you can all see my screen right now. I'm on the BC Libraries Cooperative website. If you can't, just um, jump in and shout. And the reason why I'm here is because on this website, there are a lot of support services for you. And one of those is the documentation for the LibPress website itself. So if you look under the support tab for LibPress, you're going to find the documentation. So there is quite a bit in there. If you ever have a question or you're not sure about how to do something in LibPress, have a peek in here and see if it will answer your question. So you see that we've got a section here for LibPress manual. And there are a number of sort of the more popular um, support questions. These are some of the chapters straight from the manual. And if you click on any one of those, you'll dive right into the manual. And up in the left-hand corner, you've got the home button, and that's going to take you to the home page for the document. You get a big table of contents, um, and you can take a look in here and see if any of these pages will answer your questions. So I've been poking around in there a little bit re recently, and most of it is looking up to date. There might be one or two pages that need a little bit of updating. If you come across those, just send the co-op an email and just say, hey, I think this is out of date. Can you just refresh that? And that's really helpful for us. Okay, so I'm going to dive into the websites. And again, I'm going to give a little bit of a tour of the website. So some of you are really familiar with your websites and how it's laid out. Some of you are new to this, and so that's why we're doing this refresher tour of the front end. And I'm going to be jumping around through a few of the different websites because I think there are some great things going on, and people and different libraries are doing different things on their websites. So it's always great to have a look at some of the other LibPress websites, 
see what they're doing, and if you can incorporate anything that you like from other websites into yours. So we'll jump around a little bit, and um, I'm going to start off um, taking a look at my home library website. This is obviously the one that I'm most familiar with. I use it all the time. This is where I live, so I'm naturally inclined to use the Squamish Public Library website to begin with. So the way that we have it laid out is we've got the most important information at the top of the screen. And the reason for that is that when we first designed the websites, two of the things that people really wanted to see right away were your library hours and your catalog. So we wanted to make sure that was right at the top of the site. And that's why we've got the hours listed at the top here. People can see it right away. And we also have a box where they can search the catalog immediately. So it's set as a default for that. Now, some of the libraries we have in LibPress are multi-branch libraries. So Squamish only has one location right now. So it makes sense to have their library hours listed at the top. But for example, we've got a website in Manitoba, South Central, and they have multiple locations. So it did not make sense to list them all at the top. So some of your libraries will have branch hours instead. And when you click on that, it takes you to the bottom of the page, which we call the footer, and it lists everything out in detail there. But the most important thing was to have those hours easily viewable at the top of the screen. The next thing that I just mentioned was access to the catalog. So we default to a catalog search, but if people want to search the website, they can click the website radio button to click and search there. And the other thing that we had is we realized as we were building this is that you were acquiring all of this incredible downloadable digital media. So new ebooks and audiobooks and films and how to put that at the top of the screen so people could search through that and find that information was a bit of a challenge. So unfortunately, we're not able to incorporate that into a search box right now, but we are able to provide a link to another page on your website. So this link is a part of that search box and the label on that link, you can edit it yourself. So every library can change the label they have here and link to a page on their website that has all of that valuable content. Now, if your website has been up and running for a little while and has a label in place here, I don't recommend changing that label because that's what your patrons are used to seeing. So it might not make much sense to change it, although I'll show you where you can change it if you'd like. But if you click on that, it takes you to a page that you as a librarian can easily update yourself at any time because you're constantly bringing in new resources and dropping some resources and updating things. So here's a page on your website um, that people can get from the first click on your homepage, and it shows all of the resources that you've got from films to audiobooks. And obviously, I think we need to change a couple of the logos here to update them. But it's a very easy, quick page for you to update and for your patrons to access. The other thing I want to know on your homepage in the header here is your direct link to my account. So that's going to go directly to your catalog and link to your account there. You can also change the label for that. But again, if it's been in place for a long time and your patrons are used to that label, I wouldn't suggest changing that. But I'll show you in a minute where that is just in case. So underneath that, we have a drop down menu system and we have all the content on your website organized by these different categories. And when you hover over one of those subject headings here, you'll get a drop down list of all the other pages within that section. So it's another way of accessing content on your website, but people can also do a search for a specific page up in the search box. So that information at the top of the screen is available on every page of your website. That never changes. It's always there, easily accessible for anybody, wherever they are. Underneath that, you've got your home page, like the, the really eye-catching part of your home page. And the first thing that we have is a slideshow. And you can have up to five different slides here. If you only have one slide, in which case it's not rotating, it stays fixed. But you can have anywhere from one to five slides. And the nice thing about this is that it's highlighting some new things that you've got going on, maybe a new service or a new database, 
um, maybe an event at your library, and you can put it in here and really capture people's attention and redirect them into your website for more information. And that's really the key here for the rest of the page is that you're not trying to crowd your home page with information. You want people, people should be able to find everything they need using everything in the header up here, but you just want to highlight really special things for the remainder of the page. And if you think of the home page as being similar to the front doors of your library, you're not going to crowd the front doors of your library with 20, 30, 40, 50 posters. Of information you're just going to have a few posters in there of really special events that are coming up or some new services so think of your home page in the same way you don't want to crowd it with information but you just want to have the really special things on there that you want to promote so underneath the slideshow we've got something similar we've got three spots here three columns of information and they do something similar but it's a bit more fixed so obviously it's not sliding around um, but here's a place where people can spend a little bit more time just looking and reading at something to see what's going on. So in this case, Squamish is kept it really simple, which I think is very effective. A couple of things in here that link to other things in the website. In the website. So they've got a link to their new e newsletter. They have a link to their library events calendar, and they have information about streaming movies. So that's one way of promoting your highlights and, and everything that you've got going on in the library. Now other libraries are doing something different and this is where I think it's really important for you to look around at other Libpress websites to see what they have going on. If I have, if I take a look at, um, let me just get back here. If I take a look at South Central Library, they have some great slides at the top here. And then they've added quite a bit of information here into their highlights. So it's another um, way for you to look at your highlights. You can list in lots of information in there about what's going on, library events, highlighted services. And then what they have also done is they've put their events calendar in here. And that's something that we can set up for you. You do need to request that from us so that we can show you how to do that or we can put in the short code for you. But this section here automatically updates anytime you add a new event to your calendar. So it's not something you need to worry about. It just automatically updates whenever you put in new information. And so this is a pretty nice feature. A lot of libraries are using this in one of their highlights on their home page because it's quite visual, especially if when you're adding in new calendar events, you're putting in an image. This image will show up and it's a little bit eye-catching in there. So that's another option that you can have. If I scroll down a little bit further, you can see that they've also got a new items carousel. And so that's just rotating through some of the new items that they have in their catalog. And if somebody sees a title of interest, then all they have to do is click on that and it should go directly into South Central's catalog to that particular title where the person, the patron can put a hold on it or look at more information about that book. So that carousel is something that we would have to put in for you a matter of contacting the co-op and saying, you know, I'm interested in having this carousel on our homepage. So I'm going to scroll down. Oh, I'm just going to flip over to one other library website here. And it is, I believe, Taylor's website in BC. And the reason why I wanted to show you this one is that they also have a carousel, but in this case, it's linking to their ebooks and audiobooks. So a similar idea, it's rotating through cover pages. And when a patron sees a cover of interest, they can connect, click on it, and they will go directly to the library to go catalog with and place a hold or read more information about it. So again, if that's something of interest for you, you just have to contact the co-op and ask for that on your website. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to Squamish's site and I'm gonna scroll down. And below the highlights, that entire section that you see here is what we call the footer. So it's just got a little bit of a site map, which um, mirrors the drop down menu above and so that's just a bit more visible and static for people to click on if they wish and it's got the hours listed out 
nicely so that people can read it well, your address. Um, if you have any social media icons, they will be listed here, and as well as a map to your location. So all of that's in the footer. It's below all of the main content that somebody would be looking at, but it's the typical standard sort of stuff that you might find in a footer on other websites. If I click through to any one of the pages on our website, it will look very similar at the top. As I said, we're going to have a header across every single page on the website. We will also have the same footer at the bottom of the website. So no matter how somebody gets into your website, no matter which page they're on, that important information is always available. But once you're in what we call the inner pages, you're inside the library, you're inside the library website, the middle area changes a bit. So we've got a main content area, which will change depending on what page you're on. And over on the right-hand side, we have a column of information. And we call these, we're using WordPress here, so we call them widgets, which is a WordPress term. But they're basically little boxes of information. And they're sort of like the highlights on the home page in that they're highlighting something new and in interesting on your website or in the library. You can update these, you can put images in them, uh, links in them, you can change them whenever you'd like. You have up to three boxes of information that you can put on the right hand side of the screen here. And so in the second or third session, we'll look over how you can actually Change this information in this content here. It is, you can think of these as being like global boxes. This box of information, these boxes, will appear on every single page of the website. So if I were to click on a different page, you'll see that we have the same boxes of information. So they're a bit more global in nature, similar to what you might see on your homepage highlights. One of the other uh, features that we have, which is very important for libraries, is the events calendar, because we know that you have a lot of events going on. And this is built in. So when we go to this events calendar page, this is not something that you can edit directly. And I'll show you how to update events later on. But it's giving you a listing of events. And Squamish has requested to have this listed in the stream view. And I'm just noticing that maybe not everybody is muted, so I'll just ask you to mute. If you have any questions, just unmute and ask away. But um, if you are, if you have no questions at the moment, just make sure that you're muted so everybody can hear. So this, there's a drop down box on the right hand side, and it's by default set to stream for Squamish, but you can ask the co-op to change your default to whichever one you would like. So if I click on the drop down, there are lots of different views. And it's nice because your patrons have control over that. So no matter what default you set, if your patron has a different preference, they can choose that from this drop down menu. So if you are including images with your events, they will show up automatically here. I can look at a monthly view, and that's not going to show me the images unless I actually hover over one of those events, and then it's going to show me a little bit more information, and I can click through to get the full information about that event. But if I go back to something like the screen view or the poster board view where it's showing those images, I do know of a couple of LivePress libraries that are taking this and they are print screening this and using that as their poster in our library. So that's a really effective way of um, having branding on some of the posters in your library and quickly printing them off and having that visible inside the library for people who are working. One of the lesser used features on the LibPress websites are, uh, is the blog. And I will show you, all of you have the option to have a blog on your website. If you don't want it, we simply take it off. Some libraries are making use of it. So I've clicked over to Cranbrook's library website, and they've renamed their blog. So it's called Mike's Book Notes. 
and they're pretty diligent about updating this very regularly and it might have lots of different kinds of information in there so it might have a book review it might have something that's coming up in the library it's a, kind of like a newsletter in a way that people can subscribe to because it is a blog and it's quite easy to update whenever the library needs some of the other ways that you might make use of this is when i was working in the library i was finding that um, there was a lot of really great information that staff was sharing amongst themselves, like maybe a success story that they had with a patron. I think maybe, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just hearing some more background noise and I'm just hoping that it's not interrupting me um, and hoping people can still hear me. So if you have a chance to mute yourself, there's probably a little button somewhere that you can mute yourself, that would be great. But again, feel free to jump in and ask questions as we go along. So just talking about the blogs, I was thinking um, the blog is a great place to store information that might not be easily categorized on the rest of your website. If I think about when I was working in the library and we talked about things that happened with certain patrons, maybe we were able to find something really interesting and cool that we weren't aware of before, or maybe we found few articles in EBSCO and we found something that they could download, an ebook that they could download. This is something great that you can just quickly write up in a few minutes on a blog post and say, hey, we had a patron looking for information about homeopathic remedies for animals and we found these three articles in EBSCO and we found this book here. And you can link to your EBSCO account and so you're not only um, highlighting the incredible service that your library is offering, but you're also highlighting your database and, and whatever other books that you might have in the library. And that's not easily placed anywhere else on the website, but it is quickly, you can put it in quickly into a blog and have it there and just have a listing of these sort of success stories if you ever needed to share those. So it's just another idea for a blog. Um, so Cranbrook here has their Mike's book notes, but other libraries are also using them. Um, to highlight new books that are coming in. So they might have some book lists every month that they're putting in. So lots of different ways that you can use that blog. You can also rename it if you would like. Some people don't like the name of blog, but don't feel like it's something that might be a time consuming thing for you. It could be something really quick um, and effective for you. The one other thing I wanted to mention on these library websites, Flip back to the Squamish site, are your research pages. So we tried to organize these in a couple of different ways that would be effective for your patrons. Um, and one of those ways was to organize it by subject. So typically you have a patron that's coming in, they are not aware of our different databases. They don't know what ESCO means. They don't know exactly which database they might need or want but they do know that they want some information about um, vehicle repairs. And so that is why we're offering to categorize those databases and resources that you have by subject. But a lot of the staff were very familiar with those databases and found it easier to access them in a complete list of databases. So that is why we wanted to have both methods available. You have information by subject, as well as a complete list of your databases. And I just want to remind you of those options there. And if you were to go into one of those information by subject pages, we can look at the health, medical, and wellness. The first thing it does is it lists your databases that you are currently subscribed to. So obviously, if you were to remove one of those from your uh, resources, you can take it off. You'll have to edit this page and remove it. And anytime you add in a new, new database that would fall into this category, you would simply add it to this page with the proper means. But below that, you could also provide some recommended websites. And in this case here, we at the co-op are trying to provide some of those recommended websites for you. So this content here, although it doesn't look any different from what's above it, this content is actually provided by the co-op. We call it centralized content. So we'll talk more about how to add that into your website. So Squamish Library didn't actually add in all of this information themselves, but we realized that Squamish is going to be recommending the same BC health sites as any other town in BC. 
And the same goes for Manitoba. So we have two sets of decentralized content here for health and wellness. We have BC recommended websites and we have Manitoba rec recommended websites. So we will cover that a little bit more in depth in the next session. Below that, you might go even further. So if you have a patron coming in, they might want to have, they might need some information from databases, they might need some rec recommended websites, but you might also have some local web resources that you want to recommend to them. So you might have some um, clinics in town that you might want to list here. Any other thing, you can go in here and update that so that everything is available to this patron on this page. And then at the very bottom of the page, we have tried for our Lycris libraries to include some popular subject headings that link directly into your catalog. And so you can also go in there, you can change those at any time, you can add in those links or remove them, or you can ask us for help with that, we're happy to help. So we're trying to put everything that we can on that one page for those patrons. It is a lot of information, but it's trying to cover everything that they might need that the library can provide. Now I did mention that you would also have just the databases themselves that are listed in alphabetical order. So when a patron gets more used to a database, they can come and find it easily here. And obviously staff are much more well-versed in those databases, they can go directly there. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to log into a website and have a look around at the dashboard. If there are any questions, just jump in. I'm going to move over now to our development server, so it doesn't look as nice as your websites. Um, some of the content is out of date, so please don't mind some of what you see on this website. This is not a live website, and it's not a real library. But I'm gonna log into it in the same way that you would log into yours, which is going up into your website address bar here. You'd have your library website address here, and at the end of it, you're going to add in wp-login.php. Oops, I missed the p dot. Now again, this is all in the documentation, so you don't have to worry about remembering um, how to do that or what exactly that address is. You can also bookmark that so you don't have to remember it. So this is based on WordPress. So if you're familiar with WordPress, it's going to look very familiar to you. Once you log into your website, you will have a black bar across the top of the screen. And this indicates that you're logged in. It tells you your li library name, um, a few other controls here that we'll go over in a minute. And on the right-hand side, it lists your username and the option to log out. You can also change your password by going into edit my profile. So if you look at your library name, it is sort of like a switch. If you tap on it, it's gonna take you back to your library website. And when you go back to your library website, you can tell that you're still logged in because we still have this black bar at the top of the screen with those controls there and the Howdy M. Palmer. So as long as you're logged in, you will see that black bar there. Now, one other thing that's popped up once I went to the front end of my website is this edit page button. And I need to warn you right now, some of you may have already discovered this, but just in case, this edit page button does not work on the home page. The home page is very specialized and has lots of really incredible features with the slideshow and the highlights. Those are all administered somewhere else on the website. So if you were to click on edit page here, you're not going to get anything useful at all. In fact, it looks like this. It looks like default curtain. There's nothing you can do here. It doesn't make any sense. If you see that, don't worry. You can just go backwards and I'll tell you how to update the rest of the content later on. But that edit page button is available anywhere else on the website and that's where you would click to edit certain pages. So again, we'll go through that in a minute. I'll go back to the dashboard by clicking on the library name. 
And the first thing that we see is the dashboard and we see this sort of gray screen with a few boxes. Your libraries will show different information on the screen here. And to be honest, I never really look at this when I'm looking at library websites. Um, I go immediately to the content of what I'm trying to update. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is some of the lesser known tools um, that sometimes libraries forget about because we just don't need to use them that often. But I wanted just to remind you that they are there in case. And they are under the site manager. So on the left hand side of the screen, we have lots of different menu items here. And you will have one called Site Manager. And if I go there and I hover over, this is where you're going to change your library address, your phone number, if those things ever get changed. They don't change very often, and that's why people don't come in here very often, and that's why when they do change, it's often forgotten that it is here. This information is reflected in the footer of your website. So if I look back at, I'm just going to open a second window for this development library here. And this is just a personal preference to you, is I tend to have my dashboard open in one tab, and I have the front end of my library open in a second tab. Back and forth. So if I go down to my footer, you see hours of operation, I see the address here. This is the address that is changed under Site Manager contact information. So anytime you want to update a phone number in your footer, that is where you're going to change it. But don't forget, that information is also in one other place on the website. And our documentation, the support and the support pages, reminds you of that, that not only is your contact information in the footer of your website, but it is also under About Us and Contact Us. So if you have a new phone number, just remember to go to that second location as well. You can update it in your footer, but then also update it under your Contact Us page. Now here, obviously this is our development server, so we don't have any real content here. And just a reminder that if you've been through the development of the WordPress sites, as you libraries have been, we would have these CMSS admin notes to ourselves. So now that your WordPress websites are live, you will no longer have those, um, but that was just there as reminders. So if you're updating your contact information, make sure you update your contact us. The next thing down on Site Manager is your location map setup. So again, that's in your footer. That's the map that shows up in your footer. And you can adjust your settings here a little bit. You can play with that and experiment and see what you prefer in your footer. You can zoom in a little bit by adjusting the numbers here on your magnification. And you can change the width of the it and the height. But ideally, I think you just keep it as is. This um, the width and height that are set as a default here work very well for smartphones. And so you don't want to make it too wide where it's going to be a bit uh, cumbersome to look at on a phone. The next one down is hours of operation. Now this one does change a little bit more frequently for libraries, especially if you change your hours um, seasonally. And so this is the information that shows up top of your library website in the header, but also in the footer. So if you have your hours of operation listed somewhere else on your website, don't forget to go to that page, probably under Contact Us, and update your hours there. But to update them in the app, footer and the header, you would go to Site Manager, Hours of Operation, and you can update and change your hours here. You can signify if something is open or closed. If a library is closed on Thursday, you can keep the checkbox there. You can even put in a note. Um, I don't think too many libraries are using that notes field, but you can use it. And my change, changes will save. So now my Monday opening time should be 10 o'clock. I'm going to refresh my page. And Mondays are now open at 10 o'clock. 
You'll notice the notes don't show up in the header because again, we don't want to crowd it with too much information. But if you go down to the footer, the notes will show up there. And it will look a little bit better placed on your websites with the design in place on your websites. Again, this is just development, so it doesn't look as good as it could be. Now the next one down is called Media Link. I'm going to click on it, but I'm going to go back to my front end and back up to the header. And this button here in your catalog search box, or your search box, the download digital media, that is the link that I told you earlier. You can change it. You can change the label. You can also change which page it goes to. So if I go back to my dashboard, under Site Manager Media Link, this is where you would change that information. So you can see right now it's called Download Digital Media, and it's pointing to a particular page on the website. So I could just change the label quite easily. Again, just some caution with that because you don't want to change things up too much for your patrons. If I refresh my page, you can see the label has changed to items. And if I click on it, it takes me to a download digital media page. And this page I can update and edit at any time with information. And finally, the last tool I wanted to show you under the site manager's tool was the My Account link. So up here on the right-hand side of the page, we have a link that goes to So this is just a training instance of Sitka. If I click back to go to my website, you can change that label, you can change the link. And I'm just going to try to go back to my dashboard and under Site Manager, My Account Link. It looks similar to what we just saw with Media Link, but this is different. This is the account login label. So you can change that to login or whatever label you prefer. And here, if your link, your, if the link to your catalog actually changes, this is where you would update that. Save changes and go back to my website. And you can see the label has changed now. But again, don't change things up too often in terms of labeling for your patrons once they're used to something. You don't want to confuse them with new labels. Okay, so now that we've seen some of those site manager tools, we're going to dive into the actual editing. How do we actually edit content on our page? So you see here, I'm looking at the download digital media page. And one of the things I do want to show you is how to use the tables on the website. So we've got a title here, we've got a bit of content, and then we have some images, and we have some content on the right-hand side of those images. You can see that content on the right-hand side is nicely lined up, and that's because this is using a table. So I highly recommend using tables on your website when you need to line content up. Don't try adding in spaces to get certain letters to line up on different lines, that's not going to work well on websites. It's just different browsers will interpret things differently. You want to be using tables to line up content if you have columns of information like this. So let's look at a few things. I can go to any site on the website, um, sorry, any page of the website. And because I'm on my development server, we don't have very much here. I'm going to edit this page. So wherever you are on your website, you can click on edit page at the top of the screen. I really like this about WordPress because it gives me, I don't have to search for pages. I can just go to it as a patron naturally would go to that page. And then I click edit. And it automatically takes me to the dashboard, but it takes me directly to that page so I can edit it. And you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm in the Pages section. That's highlighted there. And in the main content area, I have a lot of information. There is the title of the page. And underneath that, it tells me what the link is for that page. You don't need to worry about that. 
on the right hand side I've got some more information about the page itself. Is it public? And that means is it visible to your patients? It could also be set to draft mode, but I caution you on setting pages to draft mode because if a patron finds that page through the menu and tries to access it, they will not be able to see that page if it's in draft mode. So try to keep things in public mode. The main content area that you're gonna be working on is this white box here. And it's pretty traditional in terms of updating it. It's got the usual icons at the top that you might see in Microsoft Word. We've got bold, italics. We've got bullet lists and numbered lists. Um, one of the things that I find interesting here is that we don't always see all of the icons that are available to us. So at the end of this list, there is something called toggle, toolbar toggle. And if I click on that, I suddenly get more. And if you're not seeing all of the icons that you're expecting to see, just click on that last one and you should get that second row with more icons and more functions for you. So once you've, you're in there, you can add in content in any way that you would like. Just type in, type in naturally. You can select words and you can pull them format them in any way that you would like. There are colors that are available to you as well, but you want to be careful in how much color you're using on your website because it can become quite overwhelming and compete with the rest of the branding that is on your website. You've got a lot of color going on with images, with your logos, with the sides, colors on the sides of your screens. Adding in more color with font colors can be very distracting. So just be a little bit careful about how you're using that. We have the undo button, which is one of my favorites here. I'm using this all the time when I make mistakes, just to undo whatever commands that you've just done. Um, so those are some of the big ones that I would use. And then what I will do is I will just quickly put in a table. So tables are quite good again for something like staff listings because you might be putting in content information, an image, and all you have to do for that is look for this table icon. When you hover over the icons, it tells you what they are, and you want to insert a table. And you can choose how big that table is, and don't worry if you're not entirely sure how many columns and rows you want, because you can add them in after or remove them after. But I'll add in, say, three columns and four rows. When it's first added in, it's really scrunched up. It's a little bit hard to see. So sometimes what I do just to improve the visibility is I just, I just type random letters. And the columns open up a little bit more. So it's a little bit easier for me to see and work with. And then I can just delete those letters afterwards. So I have this grid. Here's where I'm going to start adding in some information. If it's a staff listing, I might have those as my column headers. You may or may not want to have column headers. That's up to you. So as I type, the columns will automatically widen to take in all of that information. And then what I can do is, if I'm not ready to publish it for my patrons, I can do a preview. So I also use this button a lot. It's over on the right-hand side of the screen. Preview changes. And when you click on that, it's just going to give you a little update. It's going to open up a new tab, and it shows you the changes that you've made. Now, all of your tables are going to look a little bit different depending on your design for your website. So you might have some darker lines that were incorporated into your design. Um, that, if you have ideas around how you want tables to look, let us know. But that was the built-in part of the design that was added to your website. So they'll all look a little bit different depending on whose site you're looking at. So I can flip back to my dashboard and I can format 
some of those headings the same way that I would format content anywhere else on that page. Start bolding things. Um, you could add in more information. You can keep previewing your changes and, and um, go back and make some changes if you'd like. The other thing that you can do is you can start to add in some images. And tables, again, are a great way of lining up content, particularly images on the website. So images can be a little bit tricky sometimes in terms of placement and aligning them with the text on your website. But sometimes tables are really helpful for that. So I will talk about images next there. So images, I would say probably one of the, the trickier parts of your website. In WordPress, on your LivePress site, we are referring to images as media. And that also includes PDF files. So up here, you will see an Add Media button. That means images, but also PDF files. We just have to think about the term of how we're calling them a little bit differently. So say, for example, I wanted to add an image on this page. I could click my Add Media button. And what it does is it defaults to my media library. So if you've been adding images to your website, they will show up here. You can see we've already got a couple that were uploaded to our development site. But I'm deciding, no, those are not the ones I want to add. I want to add in a brand new um, image. So I need to upload it to my website. And we have some guidelines in the documentation that I mentioned at the start of the training session. There are guidelines on sizes of images. Um, so you want to make sure that they are not, you're not, not adding 10 megabyte image sizes in there. You want to try to compress them um, so that they're a relatively reasonable size. And once you have that image on your computer, you're going to upload it. So instead of using my media library, I'm going to click on the Upload Files tab. There's nothing here. I have to actually select my file from my computer. So I'm going to go and look and just grab any kind of random, go to the particular folder in my computer where there are some images. And I'm just going to click this one. And it uploads it to my website. So this has been uploaded to my media library. It's not on my page yet. If you look on the right hand side of the page, it gives me more information about that image, the title of the image, when it was uploaded, the size of it. I can delete it if I decide that's not the one that I wanted to use. If I want to insert it onto my page, I can scroll down to the bottom and just check out a couple of more things here. The size drop down box menu here is really useful. You might choose, usually what I will do is I will put in the full size image first, as long as it's not hugely massive. I put in the full size image first and then I scale it down. So that way it's not, it doesn't turn out fuzzy. If I were to put in a really tiny image, the thumbnail version of that, and then try to drag it and turn it into a bigger image, it's going to turn out fuzzy. So I do recommend to usually try to put it in as a full size image. Insert it into my page. So it shows up where I had my cursor button. And when I'm there, you'll see it's got some squares around it. I can click and drag on that to resize that image. I can also move that image around. Usually, I don't want to move around now. Sometimes I have trouble dragging and dropping things. And so if, I'm, if it's not allowing me to drag and drop something, what you can do is you can cut the image and then paste it somewhere else. So I'll do a control F, cut that image, and paste it where I wanted it. So I'm not sure what that is. Sometimes there's a browser issue. Sometimes maybe it's my development site today. Usually you can click and drag an image, move it to where you want on your site. If you cannot do that, cut that image using control X on your keyboard, and then paste it with control V to the location where you wanted it. There's always a workaround, always a workaround. So now that image is in my table, um, and then the content is next to it. So there's, I'm going to preview that and just see what that looks like. So it's going to go into 
when I click the preview button, it's not going to open a new tab now because it already has opened a new tab. So I have to go to that tab and you'll see that image is in my table now and the content is nicely lined up next to it. And so that's one way of lining up content on any images on your website or use it is to use a table. The other thing that we have are um, shared media. So we recognize that a lot of you are using the same images over and over. So particularly database images, maybe some social media icons. And we've tried to put a lot of that image, a lot of those images into the shared media folder. So if I click instead on shared media, we get this shared media number. And you can see a lot of the database logos in there. Um, you can, all you have to do is click on one of those, choose the size of image that you want on the right hand side. If you have a link for it, you can put it in here, link to, and then insert that image. Now, what's interesting about the shared images is that it did not show up where my cursor initially was. So when you're adding in your own local media, it shows up where your image, your cursor was. In this case, with the shared media, just scroll down a little bit further, and you'll find it at the bottom of the page. I'm not entirely sure why that happens that way, but don't, don't worry about that. It is there. It's been added to your page. It's just located at the bottom of the screen. And now you can see I was, for whatever reason, I was able to click and drag, and I was able to drag that to the location where I wanted it. So those are images, and I also wanted to show you the one other thing about media, and those are the PDF files. So we are quite often adding in PDF files, whether they're staff reports or, the, or, or library reports or new book lists. We have a lot of report PDF files that we might be able to upload to our websites. They are uploaded in much the same way as images and graphics. So wherever you want that PDF file to show up, just put your cursor there and think of it again as a media file. So I'm gonna to go to my add media. If I already had that PDF file loaded into my library, I would find it here. But typically we're adding, adding in a new file from our computers. So I click upload file, select the file, I would search around my, on my computer for that PDF file. And once I found it, I select that, open it. So you can see the process is exactly the same as with graphics. But on the right hand side, it looks a little bit different. We don't have options to resize it because it's not an image. But we have some of the same information at the top. It tells me what the title is and the size of it. If I were to insert that into the page right now, I get the link to it. So I'll do a, a preview of pages. And you'll see if I scroll down, I get a link to that PDF file. So it should open up. I'll get PDF right away. And it, I just grabbed a random PDF file here. And it opens up nicely for people to look at and download if they wish. The only trouble with it is that it's not very nicely typed out there. It looks like a title of that file, which it is. So we want to change that. We want to make it a little bit more readable for our patrons. So I'm going to go back to my edit page. And when I look at that, if I click on it, it shows you underneath it the link to where it's going, but it also has a little edit icon here, which is that little pencil button. And if I click that, I can change the link itself, which I don't want to do, but I want to go into link options. And under link options, we have link text. And here's where I can change that text. And it's not the only place, but it's one of the places where I can change that so it looks a little bit nicer. Because those file names always look pretty terrible when you add them in first. So now I'll say update. And it's looking a little bit nicer. It still has the line underneath it because it is a link, but it looks a lot more readable. 
The other way that you can update that title is simply to type directly. So you can put your cursor in there and just start. And that's the easier way of doing it. But sometimes people like to go in and, and edit using the edit screen. So whichever way you prefer will be fine. And I can preview those changes again. Make sure that shows up right. And it looks a little bit nicer now. List of organizations. So we just have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to quickly go over the inserting links. And we have a couple of different kinds of links. We have internal links and we have external links. If you're putting an internal link on your website, it means that you are going somewhere else on your website. Maybe you're on a particular page and you're redirecting it. You want to send somebody to the health and wellness page. So you're staying on your website. You're staying internal. An external link will go somewhere else. So I'll show you the difference here. We're going to type in, uh, say, an external link to the CBC website, as an example. If you want to add in that link, what you need to do is type in your text that you want for that link, highlight it with your cursor, and then click on the Insert Edit link in the icon bar. And here you can type in whatever that link is or copy and paste it from somewhere else. And don't forget to click the blue button that says And now I should be able to preview that. And it should have that link there for me going to the CBC website. So that would be an external link, which you would use very frequently on your website. The other kind is the internal link. And let me go back to my edit page. If I wanted to link to, first of all, I'm going to delete that link. So I'm still in that link. I just started typing there, but it's still keeps CBC website. I'm going to remove that link by clicking that break link. So wherever I am on my website, I can add in a link to another page. I do the exact same thing. I type in my text, I highlight it, and then I click insert edit link. But here, instead of actually copying and pasting a URL, I'm going to type in is some words that might be relevant to that page. And I will get a list of pages on my website. And then I just have to click the one I want, click apply, and there's my link. So it's really quite easy to put in those links. I can copy, I can delete that, with cutting it off of my keyboard, I can paste it somewhere else on the website for example, into my table. So once you have those links, you can still move them around to the right spot on your page. If I'm in my table, maybe I just would like to have another row in my table. So one of the other things in your table is that if you go, if you're inside your table, put your cursor somewhere, anywhere in here, you can go to the table icon, and you have a lot of options here. Um, so one thing that we would use a lot of would be to insert a row or a column or to delete a row or a column. So I'll just insert a row after that. I've sort of thrown a lot at you today in terms of adding tables and PDF files and images and links. Um, but those are some of the basics. And the next session, what we will be covering also a lot would be events, um, the home to highlight slideshow, but also any other topics that you would like to have covered in the session. So if anybody has any suggestions right off the bat, um, please jump in and then let us know right away. You can, you can turn yourself off mute and tell us right now, or you can email us and let us know um, if there's anything in particular that you would like to go through in these next few sessions. So I'll just give you a few seconds to think about that. Um, while you're thinking about that, uh, I don't. Scott, do you have anything else that you'd like to add for today?
Oh, Scott might be on mute. Um, just wanting to see if anybody else has anything else to add or ask about or would like to see in the next couple of sessions. Okay, well what I will leave you with is if there's anything really that you really want to make sure is answered in the next two sessions, email uh, the library co-op, let them know, um, and they'll let me know as well. Um, next session we will be covering mostly those events, highlights, slideshow, a lot of the stuff on the home page, and I'm sure some of that stuff will flow over into the third session as well. But do let us know if there's anything in specific you want to go through. And if anything else, anybody has anything else to add, jump in right now. Otherwise, we will sign off in a minute. Okay. Well, I thank all of you for joining us today. And um, I look forward to speaking with you next week, which is going to be on the Tuesday, Tuesday, March 5th, at the same time. And, uh, and we will cover more in depth with Live Press then. Thank you very much. Uh, and before you go, I'm just going to jump in, Marie. Uh, if you haven't signed up for next next week, there's still uh, room. Uh, so please use the same form that was before. You can also just email me. Uh, um, it's just so that we email out the details uh, and we know, kind of have a head count. But uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Hopefully that was helpful to you. And uh, look forward to seeing you online and also in the next training session. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.